the tropical bird life of the Americas, rich and complex. Some 1,800 species using every food source the surroundings offer. A common seed eater, the rufous collared sparrow. Across 500 miles of open ocean, the Galapagos Islands. Here, another common mainland bird, the blue-gray tanager, which lives on a mixed diet of insects, berries, and fruits. In the Galapagos, sustained by the same sort of mixed diet, is Camarinchus cetacula, a finch. Still another mainland bird, the black-faced dacnus, primarily an insect eater. In the Galapagos, similar habits are seen in Certhidia olivacea, a finch. How does it happen that finches have come to play so many roles in the Galapagos? And what does this tell us about the process of evolution? By 1835, the Galapagos had been part of the known world for nearly three centuries. Ships and men of all sorts had called here or been blown this way by chance. Adventurers, pirates, traders, whalers, they took what the islands had to offer and went their way. But in 1835, a British survey vessel, HMS Beagle, arrived here. On board was a young naturalist who would be the first to comprehend what the Galapagos could tell us about the nature of living things, Charles Darwin. Nothing could be less inviting than the first appearance. The dry and parched surface being heated by the noonday sun gave to the air a close and sultry feeling. The brushwood appears from a short distance as leafless as our trees during winter and it was some time before I discovered that not only was almost every plant now in full leaf, but that the greater number were in flower. Bizarre forms of life almost seemed the rule here. Someone like Robert Fitzroy, the Beagle's captain, could explain it easily. This is one of those provisions of infinite wisdom by which each thing is adapted to its intended place. But Darwin looked and wondered. Considering the small size of these islands, we feel the more astonishment at the number of their aboriginal beings and at their confined range. Seeing every height crowned with its crater and the boundaries of most of the lava streams still distinct, we are led to believe that within a period geologically recent, the unbroken ocean was here spread out. Hence, both in space and time, we seem to be brought somewhat near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on the earth. So many new things to see and ponder in hopes of solving that mystery. The commoner forms were also collected, but in a routine way. The verdict of an earlier visitor, Colnett in 1792, seemed valid there were no great number of land birds, and those I saw were not remarkable for their novelty or beauty. Then Darwin learned an odd fact. Old hands in the Galapagos could look at the details of a tortoise shell and tell which island the creature had come from. Darwin took new interest in what he'd called the few dull-colored birds around him. Did they also differ in recognizable ways from island to island? Darwin was forced
forced to admit he never dreamed that islands about 50 or 60 miles apart and most of them in sight of each other formed of precisely the same rocks placed under a quite similar climate rising to nearly equal height would have been differently tenanted. But such seemed to be the case. The finch-like body form was essentially the same in all the various birds to be found on individual islands and throughout the island group. But there were marked differences to be seen in the size and shape of the beaks. At one extreme, a narrow pointed warbler-like beak. This species, classified later as Certhidia olivacea, occurs on all of the 16 main islands of the Galapagos group. At the other extreme, the huge wedge-shaped beak of the species eventually called Geospisa magnorostris, found on 13 islands. Darwin, knowing now that his specimens had to be separated island by island, collected enough birds to establish by later study that between these two extremes was an almost perfectly graded sequence of intermediate forms. A possibility suggested itself. Seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. Some 20 years later, in The Origin of Species, Darwin offered his explanation of the process by which, over endless ages, life forms had been taken and modified. The Galapagos are less remote now than they were in the Beagle's day. Some signs of the present are apparent. But outside the few settlements, the Galapagos are still enough the same that it's possible to reconstruct the evidence by which Darwin was able to solve that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on the Earth. The conditions that would have to be built into a modern environmental laboratory were naturally present here. It was a closed experimental system. The Galapagos group isolated from the mainland, the islands isolated from each other. Geologically, they were young islands of known volcanic origin, so it was possible to know the earliest time when experimentation could have begun here. Since the higher islands all offer several foliage zones with a resulting variety of food sources, a broad and complex range of experiments was possible here. The evolutionary laboratory was here. All that was lacking was a population sample, suitable guinea pigs. There is no evidence that a land bridge to South America ever existed. We can theorize that winds and storms, freaks of nature coming at rare intervals, brought the Galapagos some of its population. A random process of drift and wandering over the enormous span of geological time would account for the rest. Darwin guessed as much. Most of the organic productions are aboriginal creatures found nowhere else, yet all show a marked relationship with those of America. The archipelago is a little world within itself, or rather a satellite attached to America whence it has derived a few stray colonists. We can't say when the finches got here, or how. We can't even really say that finch is the true ancestral form of the present birds. But birds with more or less this body shape, and a beak of some sort, did arrive in the Galapagos as stray colonists. The beak, whatever its shape, had been suited to the food sources available to them in South America. Now there was a new range of sources, and not nearly as many competitors as before. The laboratory had its guinea pig. The experiment began. Could a paucity of birds be taken and modified for different ends? Food, though plentiful in the Galapagos, is a problem in other respects. Nothing can live here, except in the moist uplands, unless it is able to withstand heat and periodic drought. Seeds have thick coatings. Insects, burrowing after moisture and shelter, are inaccessible. So the food sources all put some special demand on the finch. Biting, or crushing, or probing. The ancestral bird could only exploit its new surroundings if one tool 
the beak, could be made to do many jobs. A single tool, modified in subtle ways, can do many jobs. The beaks, as we see them now, are almost like pliers of various sorts. A pair of heavy-duty lineman's pliers is best suited to biting and crushing. So is the beak of Geospeza coni rostris. Diagonal pliers serve much the same use. So does the beak of Camarinca cetacula. Parrot head pliers have crushing strength all along the jaws and a strong bite at the tip. So does the beak of Platyspeza crassirostris. Chain nose pliers enable the user to probe and bite sharply at the tip. The beak of Cactuspeza pallida has the same usage. Needle nose pliers can probe into hard to reach places and grasp objects inside them. Certhidia olivacea uses its beak in much this way. Curved needle nose pliers refine the probing and grasping usage one step further. So does the beak of Pinaroloxius inornata. But how did the process of change by which these and other beaks resulted come about? Darwin suggested an answer. No one supposes that all the individuals of the same species are identical. These individual differences are of the highest importance, for they are often inherited, as everyone knows. They thus afford a material for natural selection to act on and accumulate. Actually, the harsh demands of survival in the Galapagos serve to encourage a process of change. When in former times an immigrant settled on any one or more of the islands, or when it subsequently spread from one island to another, it would undoubtedly be exposed to different conditions of life. If then it varied, natural selection would probably favor different varieties in the different islands. The process of change, as a later writer summarized it, is simple. New forms originate when forms differentiated in geographical isolation later meet in the same region and keep distinct. The meeting of two forms in the same region must, when both persist, result in subdivision of the food or habitat. The repetition of this process has produced the adaptive radiation of Darwin's finches. The same limits are imposed on all living things in the Galapagos. Aridity and instability. These are facts of life here. It's no place for a specialist. Survival depends on opportunism and versatility in food getting. All the Galapagos land birds show these traits to some degree, but the finches show the widest range of activity. Even their day-to-day -day habits are noteworthy. It is common to see a bird move objects 20 to 30 times its own weight in quest of seeds and insects. On Culpeper Island, the sharp-beaked sparrow finch, Geospeza difficilis, will sometimes feed on eggs. Normally, the adult birds won't leave them unguarded, but if they do, the finches don't hesitate to make a meal of them. Ticks on the hides of iguanas are part of the diet of the small-beaked sparrow finch, Geospeza fuliginosa. It benefits the iguanas as well. A source of irritation is removed. The benefits are less apparent in the relation between the boobies of Wayman Island and the resident subspecies of Geospeza difficilis. Probably this feeding pattern also began with the finches removing pests of some sort. Naturally, the sharp-beaked birds would sometimes draw blood, and apparently over the course of time, they came to exploit this food source regularly. Blood is not the mainstay of their diet. 
They live on a mixture of seeds, insects, and plant materials. But their vampire-like habits may help get them through periods when food or water are scarce. Darwin, in his brief stay in the Galapagos, did not happen to see the most remarkable feeding adaptation of all, the use of tools by Cactus pisa pallida and Cactus pisa heliobatis. Tool use suggests intelligence at a level which one would only have expected to see in the primates. It's hard to guess how Darwin's thinking might have been influenced by such a sight as this. The range of differences to be seen in the finches is so broad. The lines between one species and another are so indefinite. Are we really justified in regarding them as distinct variations on a single ancestral form and not just what one writer called a hybrid swarm? The evidence of a common ancestor is clear. All Darwin's finches build a recognizably similar nest. Other resemblances can be seen the color of their eggs, plumage, beak colors, the palate form and jaw musculature, the unspecialized digestive tract, a recognizably similar pattern of flight. The question of species lines is harder to answer. Everyone, from Darwin on, has agreed that the finches are baffling to classify. But field observations confirm that forms differentiated in geographical isolation do meet in the same region and keep distinct. A female Geospeza fuliginosa explores the nest prepared by a male of her species. A male of another species attempts to intrude. The male fuliginosa comes to the defense of the nest and is intended mate. The intrusion and the defensive response by the male are mostly a matter of territorial rights. The male may lose the nest, but not the mate. Whatever the outcome of the fight, she will still react to subtle differences in the rival. Either she will refuse to mate, or the mating will be infertile. The investigations which began with Darwin have answered the major questions as to structural adaptation by the finches, but a whole new range of questions can be raised as to behavioral adaptation. Localization is an example. The song varies with each species, and their even length. Is a given song suited to a particular habitat? Does it improve communication among the birds and give them one more means by which to subdivide a locale and make better use of it? On Tower Island, the foliage is sparse and scattered. Geospeza magnorostris there has a clear and penetrating song, which carries well over open ground. On Santa Cruz, the vegetation is dense and brushy. The song of Geospeza magnorostris there has a buzzing quality a sound well suited to penetrate a mass of foliage. 
Charles Darwin, pondering what he saw on these islands, arrived at a general solution to that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on the earth. But other questions remain, and the Galapagos may supply some of the answers. <laughs>